Welcome to episode 116 16. of the Carmudgeon Show. W116. No, we don't talk about W116 oh, at all in this episode. Not a single mention of an old Mercedes, is there? No, I'm sure we did. Um, Damn it, of course we did. Of the Carmudgeon Show, this is us continuing to answer um, questions that were posed by viewers in the Lotus episode. People ask really good questions. Yes. I mean, there's one or two people in there who are sick, twisted individuals. Yes. With whom I would like to be friends. <laughs> That's my Obviously. type of person. You being Jason Camisa, me being Derek Tam hyphen Scott, uh, part of the Hag- Haggerty Podcast Network. Having a stroke. Can you yes. smile for me? Can you clap? Uh, uh, yes. You can clap. No. With, no, no. Means, oh, no, it was a good clap. Uh, that means I am having a stroke. Shit. Uh, Call 911. You did um, Haggerty Drivers Club already, so we yeah. are good. To I recorded it already, but it's but not it's happened in the yet. Future. Okay, exactly. Yes. Guys, don't step over that. And also, look, Haggerty Gear. That benefits teen drivers. Bye. We should just do it at 6 a.m. You. 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 Well, let me figure out where we stopped. Oopsies. While Derek gets uh, reacquainted with his laptop, let me remind you, you can help support these videos by joining the Haggerty Drivers Club. It includes a subscription to our award-winning magazine, unlimited access to our valuation tool, 24-7 flatbed roadside assistance, free classified listings, exclusive coupons and offers, and early access and VIP perks to select Haggerty events. More info in the link that I hopefully will type in below. All right. That was weird. That wasn't in the intro. Well, I, you know, what else am I supposed to do? You're sitting here like boring our audience with like, I'm you know, sorry, keep I'm just on the laptop. trying to find the mm-hmm. cues so that we may A them, uh, resuming from... Well, hurry the F up. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, no, I'm What kidding. is your favorite under 35... Oh my God. So much stress. So fast. Okay. What is your favorite under $35,000 weekend car for low cost of depreciation? I think generally weekend car and low cost of depreciation go together because the cars that don't depreciate are the ones that enthusiasts care about when they are old. Cars that depreciate are ones that the buyers of don't care about once they're old. Mm. You know, regular cars yeah. for the most part. So, you know, I think those two go together pretty well. I mean, uh, you could start by saying ND2 Miata because they somehow aren't depreciating. Are they not? Mm. No. Mm. Okay. I mean, maybe that's changed, but the last time I looked, they were barely, barely moving. Enthusiast so, cars, generally, I think yeah. that's true. That having been said, a 10 or 15-year-old GTI is basically free. Yeah. There are a lot <laughs> of enthusiast cars that are basically free. Yeah. Um, um, okay. E36 M3 to finish For on. For weekend, a, don't you want a convertible or something that's not sedan-y? Or I don't something? like sun or wind. <laughs> so convertible is not my answer. Okay. For anything. But is it enough of an experience that's different from a daily? Like, I would totally daily the fuck out of an E36 M345. So, mm, like, okay. I'm thinking... You want thir- something more unhinged. Well, or just something different. Experience. So, like, 35K buys you an Alpha GTV. Here we go again with this. The 105, right? Can't Barely, you get a 2000 GTV? Yeah, maybe. That's a maybe. lot of experience for 35,000 bucks. Um, yeah. Okay. 911 SC. Does that? Can you no. Get, no? God, that <laughs> Those is. are like a shit one is forty, and a decent one is like fifty, sixty. Um, Elise. Are those still that cheap? Those have gotten expensive for nice ones. 40 for nice ones, 35 for a shit pile that you want to drive on the weekend. I don't know. Okay. 35,000 bucks. Um, GTV6. Sure. Sure, but, uh, that works. unless you're not working on it on the weekend, then you'll be working on it on the weekend. It didn't say what you were doing with it on the weekend. It just said weekend car. It means I mean, you're wrenching. Here, here we go. R129 500 SL. Unbelievable weekend car for half that money. Yeah, it's not that thrilling of a driving experience. So it depends on how you like okay. to spend your it weekends. It is a 300 horsepower convertible that's exceptionally well built. And, you know, there is some inherent joy in that, but I'll give you that. Um, Mark 1 GTI, Mark 2 GTI. Yeah. Definitely. Mark three VR six GTI. If you can find one. Well, if it's there's like know, it's six left. Ground. Yeah. Um, Corrados Japanese. are they there? You a higher mileage Corrado has is to still, be a VR six. Yeah, has to be a VR six. Absolutely. Um, Sorry, that was implied. Oh my god, I could do so much. In fact, I have done so much damage. Any every one of my cars fits this. Um, okay. Um, Nine eighty seven uh, yeah. Cayman S. Yeah. Friend of mine just, I think, bought or from another friend of mine an RS60 yesterday for under under thirty five grand. 
Really? Or, yeah, a 44,000 really? 44, mile RS60 silver with a red top. What transmission? And red interior, Manuel. Really? I that drove cheap? it. Oh, those things are kind of enjoyable. Really yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love that it doesn't come alive until 5,000. So, and he test drove it and he he's like, I didn't want to shift over 5,000. I'm like, get back in and do it again. And the seller, who's a buddy of mine, who, who's actually the guy who bought Rose Gold, the E30. Um, mm-hmm. He was like, no, 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 man, you got to do this. And my friend was like, nah, I don't know if I want to do that. I'm like, get in. So I tore ass around the neighborhood. And that motor is so cammy. Mm. Anyway, yeah. yeah, so that's a, that's a lot, of, lot of experience for right, the dollar. For grand. I mean, you could get a 996 also. True. That's you a You could car. even get kind of a rough uh, 997 for that kind mm-hmm. of money. They've gotten to price to where they should be again. Yeah. Okay. Lots of options there. Uh, many options. Uh, possible episode about Derek's cars and or history of the Mira. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> I covered cars. the history of the Mira in the Revelations episode. Uh, this car has I burned to the ground three times yeah. and wants to die. Yes. That's all you need to know. It's true. Actually, uh, it didn't, well, one of the times it burned was probably after a crash on the banking at Monza when the engine seized because it has shit oiling. Yes. So there's that. That is true. Yeah, that's a fucking cool story. It I is mean, cool. you're sick of it, but then. Yeah, that is uh, the guy who, one of the early owners of it was a factory dra- uh, racing driver uh, for Abarth, I think it Otherwise was. Otherwise known as Abarth. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if you're a heathen. Heathen. Uh, okay. Uh, there have been a lot of times where you say the BMW 2002 isn't for you. Me or you? Yes. Both of us. Okay. Neither of us likes Shit. that car. I was hoping to get out of this one. <laughs> uh, why? <laughs> because the E30 is a better 2002 than the 2002 could ever be. Yeah. I agree with that. I mean, if you look at a 2002 underneath and an and E30 underneath, you're talking about a direct lineage of exactly the same car um, with just a continual and tremendous amount of improvement. So 2002 is a steering box. The E30 has a rack. I think. Am I crazy? I don't know. I think so. 2002 has got brakes that are this big and little control arms that are engine, dainty or whatever. Engine is, is, and then the an real, is, is the real reason, I yeah. think. I think you can't enjoy a 2002 experience having driven an E30 in anger. I. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Um, there's nothing wrong with them. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with them. I consistently mm-hmm. find that era of BMW to be underwhelming from a driving experience. I think it's because I reference, you know, cars like the E30 and the E36, and that is the definition of BMW joy to me. And you also reference unattainable cars that most people can't get into, and but also cool 911s. Yeah, yeah, and Alphas. And yeah. all of those cars are more gratifying to drive right. quickly. Not as well built. Um, in the case of the Alpha, true, not as reliable, but more gratifying than a 2002. With that said, I mean, I've never driven a 510. I'm sure those cars are wonderful to live with overall. And the the deficit that they have in experience is more than made up with the quality of... Yeah, that's an interesting point. I've never driven a 510. They were known in period as um, Porsche beaters because mm-hmm. they would, I think it was E production uh, in, uh, you know, SCCA racing. They were just beating Porsches, which was a big deal for the upstarts from Japan, Mm -hmm. especially given this was mere years after they appeared. Mm -hmm. To me, always, though, it's just like the sound of the six-cylinder L-series engine is so wonderful that I just don't know that I could ever truly enjoy a four-cylinder L-series. And I would say the same about the BMW So then you get a 240Z. Right, Right, exactly. You get a 240Z and you get a 325 And they used to be the same price or, you know, I guess 240Zs have gotten expensive. That's another $35,000 that, yeah. joyful car, actually. And man, is that a joyful car. Especially yeah, especially when set up swap. correctly. Um, <laughs> so buy so, a $20,000 one and swap a $15,000 Rebello 3.5 in it. And so this is a crazy. sign of my age, but I paid $8,500 for my Z, which had blue plates and was orange and records back to new and already had a 2.8 swap in it. Mm-hmm. And I gave Rebello six grand and the car came back with a fresh three liter and a five speed swap for oh six grand. But... Yeah. This was well, literally more than a decade ago. In my day. Back in my day. Uh, okay, this one is kind of fun. If you had to give someone a car as a white elephant gift, something ostensibly nice but they can't get rid of and guaranteed to financially cripple them, what would it be? Oh. Who thinks of this sick shit? I want to be friends with this person. <laughs> I have some answers. Okay, a car that's ostensibly nice to own, but will actually is actually terrible will bankrupt them. Bankrupt them, yes. White elephant gift. 
Oh my god! I mean, an Espada would bankrupt them. Oh, you're you're pretty. You're thinking high end. Oh, I was thinking W8 Passat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that um, would bankrupt anyone. Any Audi. Yeah. Any Audi. Yeah. Any, and then you're like V10 Touareg. Yeah. Um, a uh, any vintage Rolls Royce or Bentley, like yeah. a Turbo R or something like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, that's a great one. Yeah, that's a really great one. Look at how fantastic I look waiting for a tow truck through Haggerty Drivers Club with guaranteed flip it. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> we're we're not in that part of the episode, Jason. Oh, uh, okay, this person is saying looking for a practical snowworthy enthusiast daily driver. They have an NA Miata and currently are using a WRX wagon, but they are finding the sluggish engine and slow response to be disappointing. I just don't know that you can find an all wheel drive car, daily snowable car that uh, will live up to the standard set by an NA Miata. Yeah. 323 GTX. No, those no. are supposed to be fragile. E90. 335i x drive really fuck yeah 300 300 ish horsepower more like 350 a rear bias all-wheel drive system that allows you to be sideways at all times and helps you hold drifts and a manual hmm, plus i mean r32 skyline <laughs> r32 golf oh okay the other r32 uh but is that really going to be more responsive than a wrx the R32 Golf? It's a VR6. Yeah. No turbo. Mm. 335 is, I mean, I'm not one for turbo engines, but that N54 was fucking insane. That was a great engine until you have to replace. So budget in $15,000 for, you know, turbos because you have to do all manifolds. They're expensive, but whatever. That's a hell of a car. And get a post facelift so you have that good eye drive or an early car with the single hump dash with no. Mm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, okay. that that's a hell of a snowworthy car. There's got to be other snowworthy cars. Um, I mean, the problem is that the, you would recommend a WRX, and the fact that this person is already describing a WRX, really I wouldn't. They're that they're just too fucking laggy. Mm. Um, like last generation what STI about? was laggier, but uh, but I like that it still had hydraulic steering and a and a rod shifter instead of the cable and the. Um, it's kind of something it's else. Mitsubishi Evo. Evo was fun. I f- God damn it! I feel like there's got to be another snowworthy Macan. I mean, they're not bad. I know. The drive, That's why I said I'm that. Trying to think something with a manual and all that. Yeah, all right, let's give that's up. Fair. Uh, because otherwise, it's Mazda CX-50, and uh, here we are again. Are those, aren't those expensive? You know, whatever. Did he say cheap? No. Two thousand five. So I assume we are looking for some two thousand five WRX. Mm. We're looking for something in that price range. Mm, yeah, E ninety. Okay. With a, a good Until something goes wrong, yeah. Uh, DTS setup that a well set up 911 SE can capture most of the RS experience. Uh, what setup and mods are you, is he referring to? I would put that car on a big diet. My I had a three two that I think that car is supposed to be like twenty nine fifty or so, and mine was twenty five fifty, so it was four hundred pounds lighter, uh, which is more than ten percent weight reduction. Wait, wait, wait! A Carrera three point two is what you're talking about. Hold mm-hmm. on. So a 90s car. Uh, 88. 87. Well, you got down to 2,500 pounds? 2,550 with uh, fuel and spare on board. How in the fuck did you... What did you pull out of it? Uh, glass? <laughs> no, it still had it still had glass windows and it still had all steel body panels except for the engine lid, which was fiberglass. Mm-hmm. Uh, it had lost soundproofing, back seats. It had lightweight interior seats, no AC, no cruise control, uh, center console delete rear seat belt delete um what else stereo in that car it had a head unit and two speakers only mm. uh the whole rear parcel shelf was gone and just replaced with lightweight carpet uh and the rear side panels were also gone it had lightweight door panels no fog lights uh, that's an insane um, amount of weight to pull out of a car yeah, wow. anyway, it was, so that car was 2550 wet, 2553 wet. So diet is the first place to start. And then you can lower the car with like, um, it's torsion bars. So you can just lower it. Although the car was transitional response could have been a little better. Uh, oh, it also had a uh, probably lighter exhaust setup as well. Um, then as far as powertrain goes, bolt-ons mostly, a good exhaust system for sure. SSIs, you want SSIs. 
uh, and those are the old style du uh, dual out exhaust system, a proper dual out instead of us uh, come together and go through the cat mm -hmm. setup. Um, that will get you, depending on how much you want to spend, that stuff will be a great start for sure. And it costs very little because they're all bolt-ons. And then if you want to start getting serious, then you would start to do like real suspension and then you could build an engine and increase the compression ratio and do something to fueling. So that would probably be Weber's or EFI. Uh, and now then you're starting, starting to spend money yeah. and you'd put hotter cams in and some more compression rate. Yeah, then you're building a motor. Uh, but my car didn't have a built motor. It just had bolt-ons to the engine. Well, 2,500 pounds, it doesn't need much more power. Correct. Yeah. I mean, the car was 217 out of the box and that car with that exhaust system and a chip and an intake on it was probably 245 maybe. But that's cool. That's, you know, a hundred horsepower per thousand pounds, which is a very happy place. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so yeah, you can do that at the cheap way. And then if you want to do the expensive way, then you do motor. How will car companies, in a day in self-driving era, how will car companies like BMW and Dodge, who focus on performance and mechanics, will they distinguish themselves from, to consumers uh, over luxury brands who focus on the interior? Since mm. the the core value proposition is, I mean, BMW is long gone from that era anyway. So fuck that. <laughs> we kind of answered that last week. That you know where I said the differentiator becomes which has a better drive self-driving program and a, a nicer smelling interior. Yeah, I mean. So does there space for those brands anymore? Those performance-oriented brands? For the moment, I think yeah, so. Yeah, I guess you get the sort of design and the brand that is associated with that, the image that you are projecting. You're projecting a different image. I mean, it would be kind of fun if like the performance br brands have like a really hyper-aggressive, like new manic New York cabbie mode that's self-driving like an asshole. But the reality is we're in a, we're in a transition. <laughs> <laughs> we're in a transition where we're still driving. And so until while we're still driving, that's all going to be good. There yeah. becomes a point where no car needs to be able to pull more than 0.3 G of, of skid pad grip or accelerate quickly because you are now in a self-driven pod and no one... Right, if you're riding the subway, you don't get to specify a performance exactly. variant. Exactly, and that's that's where we'll get. Although I would, <laughs> I would ride that. Would you, I mean, would you, have you been... If in, it meant I got places faster. Okay, fair enough. But I was, you know... If no, no, you're right. It's like a bad... Like you're, you're riding with a bad Uber driver. Yeah. And you're just like, I would like to be euthanized rather than be <laughs> sitting back here dealing with the accelerative forces of this incompetent ass. I've never Sorry. called from my own uh, euthanization. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, okay. Well, you got to ride in more Ubers. Yeah, no thanks. Um... Okay, so this is about American V8s. Which, uh, given that you said that you, the small block is your favorite, why do you prefer it to the Voodoo? Mm. Um, okay, the Voodoo is the flat plane crank uh, 5.2 liter that Ford had in the GT350 models. Um, it is incredibly charismatic. Um, it makes torque kind of everywhere um, and sounds just ridiculous. However... Um, it actually doesn't take advantage of a lot of the benefits of a flat plane crank, so it doesn't have a very light rotating assembly. Um, and the bigger issue for me is long-term reliability. Like we know they they blow up, um, mm. and you know having a 5.2 liter with a flat plane crank is a recipe for uh, vibration. And sort of all I hear is that when they're racing, they kind of don't last all that long. Oopsies. What I love about the small block is simplicity. There's, sure, there's almost a honda slash porsche like obsessed gm has almost as honda slash porsche like obsession to sticking with something and continually evolving it mm. um and though there have been missteps in the gm v8 empire um and i've also never owned one let me say until the 4100 until the yeah and north star basically um, anything that was ever in a car that wasn't that bad i mean, I they, mean all they just have this reputation up. for um head gaskets yeah um, there, there, are, there are issues. What I like about the small block is it's incredibly small, incredibly simple, and then delivers not only the power and the fuel economy, but also this beautiful music. So mm -hmm. I think it sounds best of the three American V8s. It sounds by far the best. It's the most musical and the least flatulent. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that it's that efficient and that simple at the same time just makes me think. You go. Okay. Uh, this person asks a similar question to the one before, which is how are Ferrari and Lamborghini going to distinguish their powertrains from other brands if they're all going to be electric? Yeah, they're fucked. Yeah, I mean, what they're hoping for is uh, a small, you know, a small volume, volume exemption, exemption yeah. which is the only chance they have. Otherwise, it's over. 
Mm-hmm. Not when, you know, especially when a company like Tesla can come out of nowhere and th- approach a car like a tech company does and make something that absolutely something blows, that blows, them blows them out of the water. water. I mean, I just remember the first time that I genuinely took Tesla seriously was when one beat a 360 in a drag race. And I was just like, oh, right. I see. This is like. Yeah. And now there's not a Ferrari made that could come close to keeping up with the plaid. Mm. And then, you know, there's Sapphire on top of that, which is yeah. even faster. It's just it's over. Yeah, and they have to draw on their character. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you see 90s golden age double wishbone Hondas like the Civic and Integra following the same trend as air-cooled 911s? I feel like they're shedding the boy racer image uh, and being recognized as the true driver's car as as they are and prices are starting to reflect that? Um, I I think it's hard to compare a really mass market product like anything Honda makes or, you know, civics and, and whatnot to something that's bespoke, not bespoke, but something that's purpose built. Or Engineered expensive. specifically yeah. to be a sports car. I mean, this is like a GTI, right? GTI is, well, I think also what this person is saying, they're, they're starting to get expensive and they're starting to be bought by collectors. Do you think that they can do what 911s do? I think that is a reflection of the same thing that makes nice VW buses expensive, mm-hmm. which is that everyone had formative experiences related to those and none of them, so many of them just got used up and none were saved. Right. So now everybody would love to re-experience that, but there's no good ones left. And mm-hmm. so when a good one does come up, it gets expensive. And so they end up in the same place, which is that they got expensive, but I think for different reasons yeah. than Porsches do. Yeah, I think for sure. Those those are fundamentally good cars. They're not incredible driver's cars. I don't know if I would agree with that. They're good, mm-hmm. um, but they're very good. I should. I don't want to, it's not a 911. Um, and it's, you know, they're not nearly as fun as, for example, the Volkswagen Contemporaries in the, you know, from the late 80s. But, for example, they are incredibly easy to live with, much better built than most cars. Um, and so you have the nostalgia play in together with the fundamental goodness of the car and that bumps the price up together with the scarcity right and so well yeah and i think this person would point to the performance variants like the first generation is that the first generation civic si the one that you always see is blue with the machined wheels like sort of 98 Mm-hmm. No, 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 before that. Before that like one. sort of 98 or something like that. Or ITR or, you know, is this EJ generation mm-hmm. Civic Type R, which... I mean, look, give me a give me a 92 to 95 Civic uh, EX with the 1.6 liter VTEC or, or yeah. Del Sol yeah, with yeah. the crazy 160 yeah. horsepower 1.6 liter. They were they were fundamentally good cars, but I think they're not they're not incredible in terms of experience. But they're I've very, not very driven mo- really any of them other they're than that ITR. But yeah. I they ex- does experience how how would you say it compares to like a good Mark II GTI 16 valve? There's there, you know I don't like good cars. There so that Integra Type R is a nice car. It's a really well built, nice, beautiful car with an absolute batshit engine and some of the most outrageous limit handling i've ever experienced in a front-wheel drive car um other than that it's not nearly the experience of a mark ii by that point it's mark iii so it's not really fair but it's not nearly the experience of a mark ii gti in terms of rawness because it's gti is a pile of shit by comparison right it's raw it's vibration um and so they're kind of apples and oranges and if you really want your you know your hair lit on fire. It's not an ITR other than the motor. Right. Um, they're so different. It's kind of hard to tell. Mm, uh, it's kind of hard to compare. Compare. I mean, a, a Mark III, here's the problem. The Mark III VR6, which was at that time going into Mark IV, they were really refined engines and they were just not light your hair on fire the way that uh, an Integra Type R was. And there was no hot version. It's not like there was a GTI and then a, like a Golf R with, you know, a 7,000 or 8,000 RPM VR6. So mm-hmm. apples and orange a bit, but... Okay, what's with the rev hang on the new BRZ? Is this an emissions thing? No, notice. I, I've heard a bunch of people say this. I did not have an issue. Oh, really? I don't know if it was that I was driving a pre-pro car, like pre-production car, or rev hang usually irritates me, especially in gear. So you come off the gas yeah, and, and it cuts power, but keeps, yeah, keeps the throttle open. I had no issue. I, mm. I still dream all the time about a GR86, and it, it didn't do anything that pissed me off. Not one thing. Mm. So Okay. Oh. And oh, I've not driven one. Uh, Still not. You no. have to. I, I know. I know. I warn you. Okay. It could actually turn Derek into a fan of something produced after 1941. I loved my GTI, my my 2019 GTI. Uh, do you have any recommendations for driver mods? I've been looking at Dirtfish. 
or just, you know. So I would say anything that allows you to get to the limit of your car. That's the time. You just want minutes spent near the limit safely, obviously, of your car and yourself. I have not been to Dirtfish. I did go to Team O'Neill. You O'Neil. did do one, yeah, on the yeah, East Coast. Yeah, and it's similar to both. I've heard nothing but great, the same things about both. I did Dirtfish. They're, oh, and it was fucking amazing, right? Yeah. What I will say is that very little of what I knew about driving quickly on pavement mm-hmm. applied. And mm-hmm. so if you're looking to get competent at handling a car while it's adhered it's not going to be that useful it's going to be a great time and really entertaining uh and you'll get good at handling the car sideways but there's so many fundamental differences about driving quickly off pavement that it to me it was shocking how little what i knew up to that point having done a bunch of track days and racing uh had like to do with being good at that i think so i did that for the video in the e30 and i think i said in the video something like i learned more in one hour and i didn't go through the whole program i worked with one of the instructors and we just had a little bit of a fun i, I did parts of it elsewhere but for that video and he taught me a bunch of tricks I, you know i think of myself as like a car control idiot right that's what i do is we have to throw these cars sideways for filming and do all kinds of stuff i was in awe of some of the tricks that i like i never even thought to do that but I would say as a driver mod, the best bang per dollar is go into the HPDE circuit. Start with Porsche Club of America or BMW Car Club of America. SCCA. Or SCCA and go through the ranks of starting out as... Autocross. Uh, limit auto, handling. I've done, I've done autocross schools mm-hmm. and I find that autocross is more about how quickly can you get your hands to follow what... Can, how quickly can you figure out where the where the, where the fucking course goes first, then where the line is, and then how to get the car there. And track days are very different because it's orders of magnitude more time. So in an HPDE, high performance driver's ed, you have maybe an eight-hour day. Of that, you're driving for two hours. And so it's classroom session, driving session, classroom session, driving session. And that two hours on an autocross is never going to happen. You're talking Correct. two minutes I mean, if you're yeah, lucky per run. in a school. So um, I say start with one of the car clubs and graduate through that HPDE program. And don't be, don't be fucking egotistical. Like, Oh, I think I know what I, you know, I don't want to go in the beginner group. Trust me. There will be somebody in your beginner group with a car with one tenth the horsepower you that will just leave you for dead. Um, that's the biggest, I don't know how to drive moment I've had in my life was the first, first driving school. Yeah, they're fabulous. And then yeah. car control clinics on top of that, if you can do or those. Or instead of, in, or in, in advance of. Uh, yeah, sure. I think they can be concomitant, if I can use the word. Concomitant. Concomitant, isn't yeah. it? That's the word? Yeah. Yes. Anyway, you can do them at the same time because they're kind of related. They both help each other. Um, but like a winter driving school somewhere sure. that's, I did yeah. a couple of them in Pittsburgh where it just naturally would snow and they would do them. Um, hugely helpful. Yep. Definitely agree. Uh, impression of the state of the luxury American car space. Uh, yeah. And then they're saying pre-war era to malaise to now. That's like a whole episode. Um, Hold on, whoa, whoa, whoa. you have to actually read the question. So I sorry, what is your impression of the state of luxury in the American auto space ranging from pre-war to malaise era to now? How has it changed in priority Oh, in the final product's a- execution? That's an entire episode, I, I think. think. an episode. All right. We'll uh, including discussion about the non big three American brands of which there are so many and about which we probably know nothing. Is it? Mm, Duesenberg, Studebaker. Oh, well, I'm talking about modern. Brooklyn, art. Hudson, Nash, etc. Because Well, now we have Fisker and we have yes. Lucid and we have Tesla and we have... Thoughts on the rumored 2025 MR2? Uh, uh, given what the recent Toyota GR products have done, are you excited? Uh, what does it need to be in order to be a win? Ooh, I mean, it's rumored. I don't know anything about it. Um, yeah, but so this is basically a giving us carte blanche to design our ideal two-seat mid-engine, mid-engine Toyota. Toyota GR product that fits into the environment that is already established. The problem is the GR86 uh, is kind of occupying that price point already. So how do you differentiate it from that? I think it would have to be much more expensive and it would have to be an order of magnitude faster. And here's the problem with the GR lineup. You have three cars. They eat, They have different engines, right? One is a BMW, the mm-hmm. Supra. The The next one's a Subaru, um, which is the flat four. So you have an inline six and inline four turbos from BMW. And then you have a Subaru flat four. And then you have the GR Yaris and Corolla, which are a three cylinder. That three cylinder is cool and it's charismatic, but it's nowhere near enough for an MR2. Um, so what the hell do you do? 
I mean, what do they do? A, a V6? Now you're in Avora territory? I'm not sure. Yeah, so what price point does this car occupy? Is it the same price point as a Corolla GR? No, I think it's got to be the same price point as a base 718. And I just don't really? know if there's a market for that. No, I I mean, to me, that the space that car occupies is price-wise is where Corolla GR is. That's like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, you get... Well, I guess, okay, I'm saying just above that, 70, 75, then you, you can start to get into base 718 territory. Um, mm -hmm. But I just don't, I genuinely, while I would love to see something like that, I mean, that Mark II, MR2 was genuinely Ferrari beautiful. Yes. Um, not necessarily in proportion, but in styling. I mean, it was just stunning to look at. And would I love for Toyota to do something like that? But yes. everyone complained in period about how expensive that car was. I think that People really same. struggled with that. I think so what were those same. cars? They were in the 20s, mid-20s, mid to high 20s in, in the, 1992 yeah. for the tw turbo. I just, I don't know if there's that much of a market for, we don't have the disposable income that we used to have. And, you know, to spend on such an impractical car, yeah, something like that needs to be Miata money. And it would never be would never be there's your you know you have a weight penalty from a mid-engine standpoint and a cost penalty because you're putting a transverse front engine powertrain behind you which means you have to have two firewalls um and i just don't i don't i don't know i hate to say it but i don't you don't think it's a i don't uh, think toyota has a powertrain good enough right out of the off the bat that to light your hair on fire and it would need that yeah i mean it, it They've always been inline fours, so it's like, do they have any great inline fours available? So now, why do you buy this instead of an Alpine A110, which is not for sale in the U.S. right now? But I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if Toyota needs that. Okay, it'd have to really differentiate on price somehow. I think what they still should do is make a super based on uh, the Lexus LC500 the platform. They should put twin turbos on that V8 and make a fucking Ooh. crazy Supra on that. Make it really expensive, sell a couple of them, have a true Halo product for GR. This person is saying, will we ever see the spare tire as standard again, even a oh, donut? God, I hope so. I what mean, is the real reason why they aren't in cars anymore? Fucking weight and cost. Oh. It's space, space, weight and cost, right? So yeah. I'm an engineer and I say I can save, you know, these the product planners and engineers are looking to save literal hundredths or thousands of a cent per car, knowing that it all adds up. So if you're looking at something that costs them between a wheel and a tire, 75 bucks, 100 bucks, that's a fucking enormous amount. I have no idea what they cost the manufacturers, but it's got to be 100 bucks with a for, yeah, wheel with, for a full size, whatever, anything. So you're looking at a massive expense. You're looking at 60 or 70 pounds probably for half of these big cars, the modern big cars. Um, and then you're looking at the, which, and by the way, they're looking at taking literal grams out of everything. And then you're looking at cargo capacity and ground clearance, and you could just get rid of it. Like, oh, I can all of a sudden have more cargo, 10% more cargo space. The, the reality is, as an end user consumer, it fucking sucks. I mean, I just got a flat last year in my e-golf and I was two miles from home and it was three and a half hours on the side of the road waiting for a tow truck in the rain. And this is with, by the way, Haggerty Drivers Club. And they showed up and the guy didn't show up with a flatbed and he dragged the car a couple miles home, destroying my brand new friggin' tire that had a nail through the sidewall. So it was destroyed anyway. Um, but I am watching this car get dragged down the highway, you know, in the mirror while everyone's screaming and waving. It was just a terrible experience. Mm -hmm. It would have been five minutes and I would have had a, a real tire on that car. Um, the, even the van, the minivan, we took up to Oregon for that biking trip. And the first thing I threw in the back of the van is a fucking a mounted spare, spare. Yeah. and a jack. And I shouldn't have to do that on a 4,800 pound full size thing. It should have a fucking spare tire in it. And frankly, I think it's, I think the government should step in and say, you either have a, uh, a spare or you have run flats. I don't think, you know, I'm not a fan of huge government telling, you know, every car company what to do. But this one is a shock to everyone who gets a flat. What do you mean my car doesn't have a spare? How the fuck am I supposed to get home? What am I, I have to kid, pick up my kids. It's just always a surprise to everyone. So they should have to sign a disclosure. I want to sign a waiver. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see. In my past life, I was a Ferrari tech. Eventually, the novelty wore off of 800 horsepower, and I got more excited about a 360 over, say, an F12. 
Uh, do you guys have the same feeling, jaded feeling, after the vehicles you've driven? And is there a way to fix it? Absolutely. What's the way to fix it? You drive a car, that's an experience no matter how fast you're going. Yeah. Speed fades, um, but experience is always there. And yeah. So if you prioritize experience over speed, you will not lose. Yep. Um, yeah, everything is slow. I mean, that 500, that perfect perfect wrap, wrap around back to that 500E versus uh, Miata video, that an ND2 is now just as fast through a quarter mile as a Mercedes 500E, the fastest sedan on the planet when it was made. Um, everything is now, I think we all think of Miata as a slow car. Come on, everyone bitches that the that the GR86 and BRZ are slow cars. They're five four to sixty, mm-hmm. like that's not Which a fucking slow like car. BMW M5, it's a Countach area, yeah, like that's fucking crazy. So mm-hmm. yeah, no, go for experience. Horsepower is speed is overrated. Yeah, we don't, especially in this country, we don't need it. Agree. Um, it's fun though. <laughs> this one I have highlighted in green as a potential uh, entire episode. What's the best car with the worst engine and the worst car with the best engine? I think we could. Yeah, we can make an episode of that. Make an episode. Good car, bad engine. Mm -hmm. And bad car, good engine. Mm -hmm. Uh, Have you ever driven an early 2000s SVT Focus? Hold on, hard drive light is. I should get a solid state drive. No. (laughs) Okay. No, I don't think I have. Damn. Neither have I. I did try desperately to buy an SVT Contour. Really? Yeah, but I couldn't find one. Huh. Okay. What is number one on both of your spreadsheets? Well, mine is alphabetized, so it would be it's like an AC something. Mine is by date, and this spreadsheet replaced my previous spreadsheet, which was just cars I've driven, and this is uh, press cars that I've driven uh, since the start of my career. And the first was a Mazda Five stick shift minivan. Was the first was press the first car press car you car drove. I ever drove? Yeah. What about first car you ever drove? Period. First. With a like legally licensed? No, I don't think it matters. There's the Land Cruiser, yeah. Seventy five Chevy Impala. Oh, the Impala. Yeah. Um, I actually wagon. don't remember. It was maybe Saab nine thousand. My mom had one of those when I was a kid, and or maybe it was the Range Rover Classic. Probably mm-hmm. it would be one of my mom's cars because my other my dad's cars were all manuals. Uh, okay. Hmm. Have any of you driven an old Subaru, meaning before 94? You drove this XT. XT. I've driven... No, they did, didn't run. So I went to the museum and saw a bunch of crazy old Subarus. Um, I've never driven a Justy, but I want to. Mm-hmm. Um, they were so cute. Uh, yeah. Little four-wheel drive hamsters. Um, yeah, the XT, which was really terrible in the funnest way possible just horrible it had a blown shock mm-hmm. just axle hopped all over the place and the dashboard deconstructed itself it was uh yeah it was fun okay this person has asked why don't how can when should journalists include more about brand reputations long-term reliability predictions practical functions and other things other than initial perceived quality when they're reviewing cars Brand reputation is a pain in the ass because we get shit over it all the time, right? So we say yes. BMW's brand reputation is that it's the ultimate driving machine and nothing they make these days is even close to that, so whatever. And then you get all the BMW fanboys who are butthurt over it. And so I don't think brand... And the BMW corporate people too. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, you get the you sort of make fun of the people who buy the car and then the car manufacturers like, don't judge us by the dickheads who buy our car. Like Bentley said something of the sort to me once because I was not nice about Bentley customers. Um, it wasn't that I wasn't nice. I was pointing out that they were just looking for the nearest, the newest, greatest thing. Um, and where reliability concern is we genuinely don't know. Like no one could... Unless something has been historically poor... Someone sent to me the original road test for the Alpha 164. Mm. And they were like, we love this and it's wonderful. However, here's a list of the things that broke during our press loan. (laughs) Same thing with the Rover Rover SD1. They're like, all the articles were like, we would love to report uh, the fuel economy. Unfortunately, the odometer has stopped working and we can't. I mean, you can definitely report that. The problem is you never know whether that's representative of all of the cars or you just got a bad one and also what will be long-term issues even stuff like rtv and oil pickups doesn't appear during a press loan where you have the car for a few days you know or oldsmobile diesels blowing up at thirteen thousand miles you're not going to get to thirteen thousand miles on a press yeah loan i just saw 
somebody was just asking me, have I, a friend of mine was asking me if I'd heard about some issue with some fucking motor and they creep up between 30 and 40,000 miles. And the answer is no. Like we never see that stuff, even in the long term stuff. Now we did have like car and driver did, for example, have a C7 Corvette that had three motors. Like, have it. yeah, there were a bunch of motor failures, but you don't also don't know what the hell's going on with that car. Um, the best way to do that, frankly, is consumer reports. I look at their predicted reliability because what they're looking at is real world of the previous cars. Mm-hmm. And you can you can guess. I mean, you can say, well, okay, it's a carryover engine. We know the engine had no issues. Um, but then this morning I was hearing about Ford, class action lawsuit against Ford, Ford an investigation on model year 21 only, don't quote me on this, uh, 2.7 liter EcoBoost V6s in the Broncos and one other car because somebody somewhere along the lines and those eco boosts are indestructible right they're known they're twin turbo v6s they're fine except there was one model year where they switched to a different valve material and this is all secondhand information i'm getting so i'm sorry if i get the details wrong but basically there's like seven hundred eighty thousand cars that are being recalled because of the of apparently fully dramatic engine failures based on one metallurgy decision that some yeah. probably bean counter made. We're like, we can save 0.2. So does that mean all EcoBoost blow up? Fuck if I know. Yeah. It's hard to know. It's impossible to know. Um, and actually, and I'll go so one step further and saying, saying anything about it is actually not fair to the car companies. Yeah. Um, because not only can't you know, you shouldn't pretend to know. We don't know. Sure. Yep. Agree. Uh, can the buyers of, or in can the buyers or enthusiasts of a certain car or brand ruin the experience for a normal buyer? Yeah, Porsche dickhead weenies. There's too many self-indulgent wieners in this city with too much bloody money. Hmm. I mean, my boss was it just... That's what you define as a normal buyer. Okay. Fair enough. There is no such thing as a normal Porsche buyer. No, I'm kidding. But my boss was at Rensport last week and he did not have fun. He just thought it was one big self congratulatory, congratulatory masturbatorium. Fest. Yeah. And it, you know, you can definitely have BMW drivers give, okay, Altima drivers, mm-hmm. nothing wrong with the Altima, mm-hmm. but we all have like their Altima driver memes, the Mustang. I don't think there's anything wrong with the Mustang and everyone thinks Mustangs kill pedestrians at cars and cars. It's because it's a rear wheel drive, high horsepower car. That's not very expensive. So, yeah, I think the people who buy cars can dramatically shift. Look, I fucking hate Priuses. Should I hate Priuses? No, I don't actually hate the product. I love the product. But every time there's one in my way, I'm fucking irritated. I hate Subarus. Every fucking where you go in the goddamn West Coast is but a you fucking hate the Subaru product. anyway. Huh? You hate the product as well as the drivers. I don't hate the product. I just... Tell me about the transmission. It's a mooing CVT. On Subaru stuff? Yes. Yeah, it's not for me. But you know what a CVT is great for? Someone who doesn't give a fuck. Someone mm. who just wants to accelerate without a shift and ever, never feel a clunk, never. They're fine. But the fucking people who buy them and then park their fucking asses in the goddamn... Fa- oh, let me stop. Left lane. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, great. Okay. How Paolo's, Paolo's already laughing. How do you both think the car modding community will respond to electrification? <laughs> Will respond or is responding to? Yeah, I mean, is responding. There's people who do Tesla mods. I mean, people always look to individualize their cars. And I think the majority of people who individualize their cars do so not for performance reasons, but for other reasons too, for in the sake of, for the sake of distinguishing themselves from other people. So there's going to be an appetite for lowered ride heights and weird body kits and distasteful stripe wraps <laughs> and you know no whatever judgment the fuck. there or anything there's there's people are gonna do it there's a lid for every trash can right there's <laughs> it's just it's gonna happen i mean the car that performance i performance is just not gonna be the axis the or old, you want it lower the, and you want it to be ugly well, you don't know listen i mean here's the only modern car that i own is modified more than my old mercedes that e-golf has a uh, rear sway bar in it. It has wheels and tires. It has LED head high beams, LED turn signals, HID low beams, an aftermarket plug directly plug in helix subwoofer and DSP amp. It's got oh the fuck I just remembers what the Tint. hell I did to this car. Tint. It's got all I did all kinds of shit to a fucking e golf. I wanted it to pull a G on this kit pad. And I wanted it to have a really good sub and a sound system in it. Oh, and then I went in, even better, I went in the computer and I disabled 700 things. I put it in like 
New York cabby follow mode for the adaptive cruise control and it stays that way. And I made it so that I can undo my windows and redo my windows from the from the key, something that you can't do in America before because some fucking kid probably got his hand chopped off because fuck people. Um, I did 700 miles. It says man when you turn the car on. It says man instead of M-A-N instead of V-W. It says golf R or R on the center console. I don't have a seatbelt dinger. It flashes the brake lights really quickly if you get into ABS and then puts the turn signals on if you ABS to a stop. I mean, mod after mod after mod after mod, all of which make my ownership in that car a better experience. And it's just electric. It doesn't... And I've seen other people already pull that top speed limiter off of them. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't want to go faster than 85 because I missed, this I missed is my city that. car. I missed, I've found the limiter to be intrusive at times. There's only one spot where I'm always doing 80 down a hill in a 65 zone, like 79. And then there's always a clump of assholes. It's actually on the way here. And there's always a clump, clump like five lanes worth of dickwads pacing each other at like, 61 in a 65 and so i always have to like scoot around them and i often hit Use that limiter, limiter. Yeah. and i'm like shit shit i just need 86 yeah Fuck. i know and then i have to I slow know. down and go behind like admit defeat and yeah. slow down and go behind them yep. but the rest yeah. of the time i want that limiter there i do not need any more temptation mm-hmm. um yeah okay oh I, I did wireless car play i did a cell phone inductive charging mat all none of that stuff changes uh Okay. The, cab, the, f- the thing with the camera, with the dash, dash cam. cam. Yeah. Uh, okay. I drove a student's McLaren 750 GT on track Oof. and found that the brake travel is very short, almost like a race car without vacuum boost. What did McLaren do to achieve that? And does any other car have that feel? I have not driven a 750 GT. I've driven other McLarens and I did not I don't remember the brakes being poor at all I remember them being really uh, not poor I think they're just saying it doesn't feel like a boost so you just have to it's like what you want when you're left foot braking right right? you don't want a lot of crappy travel I I don't think unless they're Audi grabby Audi will tend to make brakes that you can't come to a like a slow stop Mm -hmm. um i've never found that mclaren they probably are just using a bosch e booster or some other non-vacuum boost um to actually push the pads up against the uh the rotors and pull out any play Mm -hmm. uh alpha 105s how are they as driver's cars we know you like them yeah they're wonderful they're four cylinder that four cylinder is among the best sounding four cylinders ever made yeah they are among the most beautiful cars of their era um, they have decent steering. They have decent suspension. They have decent seats. Uh, an okay shifter. Um, and they're a nice experience. Great. I would say the 1600s are, are the best sort of overall light your hair on fire experience. And it's not a fire. It's more like a little bit of smoke burn from, well, like hair dryer on too hot. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the 1750 gives it the torque that it really, the 1600 needs. And then the 2000 is just like a, 5,000 RPM lump of... No. I mean, a 2,000 with uh, cams and some head work and... Uh, yeah. and Turns it into a fast 1,600. It's a nice, yeah, right? exactly. The, and those, a hot 2,000 is mm-hmm. really pretty magical if you ever have the ex- chance. Um, I want to like those cars more than I do, and I don't know why I don't like them more. Because um, you're stuck up? No. And they're just four cylinders? I don't know I how he doesn't what even what react to that. I mean, like, I just insult you and you're like, oh, no. Oh, no well, worries. I was just, it's assumed to be true. What? <laughs> <laughs> but if it doesn't have a V12, I shan't have it. Uh, um, no, I like uh, Julia's. I don't know what it is. I think that if I'm going to experience that engine, I'd rather be in a Julietta, I guess is what I meant. Sorry. I meant Julietta. Or a Julia Super. I'm not really sure what it is about that car that doesn't do much for me. I'd rather have a Fulvia also. I don't know. Are they too pretty and too nice and too normal for you? Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's being uh, sort of let down by all the injected ones I've driven, and it's hard for me to parse that apart. And I know I drove a really hot 1750 lately, and that car was modified in a way that I don't think made it be that well resolved. I don't know. I guess maybe I need to drive one that's really well sorted and dialed. I'm not sure that I have. I Stock have- their little lame I, it's never made me buy one i mean i came close to buying a 2000 and then found out that it was it was the best driving 2000 I've ever driven and i literally had the money in my pocket and we just put it on a on a lift just to see uh because 
Chuck uh, Ray, who you probably know, who's a who's an absolute expert on cars, took one look at it from across the parking lot, and he was like, mm, "Something's wrong with the rear fender." And I'm like, "What?" And he's like, "I don't like the way that the fender bulges out. Something's up." Uh, and he looked at the other side, and he's like, "Buddy, you got a car two price for the one uh, two, uh, <laughs> two for the price, two for the price of less one than one car." And I'm like, "What are you talking about?" And he's like, "I think it was cut in half." Yeah. Sure, shit. We put it on the lift. It had been cut in half, and I didn't buy it, um, mm-hmm. which was a shame because it was the only one that I got to that point where I'd buy. Mm-hmm. I, but my first lemons car was a GTV. Um, and that was fucking magic. It was, you know, two liter was just absolute magic at, I'm sorry, it was an Alfetta GT. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, it was magic was like at the limit. dollars Yeah, no. Well, that's a transaxle car. Transaxle car. They were magic at the limit. And I thought, okay, well, if a 105 handles like this, and from everything I've heard, they're pretty close to limit and i could get the spiciness of a 1600 with the power of a 2000 and the induction noise of either of them with carbs i just gtv with a 1750 dash and i just they're they're so close to being perfect but never ultimately the decision was for the same amount of money i can have a ferrari experience and i bought the gt4 yes that's uh very true for me too 100 percent true and for less money you could have a fulvia uh, and also I really like the Julia super, which is the four door box Ford, one. Yeah. I would rather have one of those, but it's a one Oh five series car. Mm-hmm. So yes, those are, I actually have had some really enjoyable one Oh one Oh five experiences in a four door car. Okay. Uh, oops, not over a 2002 or a 2000, right? Yes. BMW. Absolutely. Sedan. Absolutely. Well, I've never driven a four door Neue Klasse. Okay. Um, I pushed one once <laughs> onto a truck. Uh, question, Derek's GT3, which one was it and what didn't you like about it, especially the part in this last video where you said that it couldn't do things the 964 did? Ground clearance. That's this is really, a 991. I had a 991.2 Touring, and uh, I like to go on bumpy roads in a hurry, and the GT3 couldn't do that. It was dragging parts so That's early crazy. that I couldn't keep up with Jason driving his Mark One Cabriolet. Uh, it's just not the right That's car for me. That's embarrassing for everyone. <laughs> That's embarrassing for Porsche, is who it's embarrassing for. Because normally I'm able to keep up with you more or less. Always. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it was just the fact that it's not the right car for the type of driving that I do. Having driven many of those cars, I think we can agree they're almost perfect. I just wish for hydraulic steering because uh, it's a big step back in that regard. Uh, and the gearing's too long to really enjoy that engine. Yeah, and ground clearance. I mean, yeah, because you get to use redline twice, first and second gear. Second gear, you'll be going in the 80s, probably. Eight. Yeah. I think it is, yeah. Yeah, so that's problematic. Yeah. But um, otherwise, they're spectacular. Yeah. So, depending on... Your results may vary, especially if you don't live on so many bumpy roads. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, God, this is tough. If you guys were a car, what would you be? I don't know. I am bad at this. There's just so many, you know, you put on the spot. <sighs> what is loud, flatulent, obese, <laughs> ostensibly Italian, but actually American with a Plurifilare. German, with a German, a, a, a German bend. I don't know. That's an interesting one. I don't know what the fuck that means. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I would be elderly some brand that no longer exists because yeah, it got put out of business <laughs> by mismanagement and excessive uh commitment excessive commitment yeah. to uh some ideal that was deeply inadvisable from a commercial standpoint okay uh <laughs> b- 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 <laughs> parts sourcing for factories i.e where do all the parts come from is there anything f- made in house or is it just 80 percent like bosch parts that are made by suppliers depends on the car company but almost all car factories are now just a final assembly plants mm-hmm. um structure modules. notwithstanding generally Often there's the structure. So, for example, like the, the Lamborghini stuff is done elsewhere. So there's and painted a, elsewhere. And painted and arrives as a full chassis, and the cars yeah. are assembled from that point. But that's on. A, not a representative manufacturer. Like for example, Mercedes Benz. Well, they actually Magna Steyr does like contracting assembly for. I mean, a some huge of them, number. Some of them are done all in one spot, but really, the vast majority of products are supplier driven. So, <laughs> you know, the I think if the supplier world fell apart, the entire automotive industry, with several small exceptions, would as well. Mm-hmm. Tesla is one. Tesla is one. I remember when I took the tour of their factory. At one of the, my the only piece of well, one of the things that really stuck with me was that they had their own press for aluminum, mm-hmm. and that it's like three stories tall or whatever, and that. 
three stories tall above ground and four stories mm-hmm. deep below ground and that it sets off the, the, the seismographs at UC Berkeley when it <laughs> is that's actuated. Awesome. That's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why Teslas are so different. Mm-hmm, because they are making things in house and they're not just yeah. buying, choosing things off mm-hmm. of a shelf. That, yep. Or they're for, when they are working with suppliers, they're working with the suppliers and installing their Tesla's engineers at the suppliers mm-hmm. to help drive progress rather than being okay with this, the status quo. Sure. This is a leading question Uh-oh. from the gentleman who found us our rover. Do you think it would be wise of Haggerty to offer classic car insurance policy for drivers under the currency current policies la- age limit? So he wants to be a Haggerty policy, uh, customer, but is too young. Have you seen the way most people under the age of 25 drive? It's 25, yeah. I think, but yeah. Uh, so to me, I, to, I would say like there should be probably some exemption clause or some like if you take this much driver's education or something like that. I'm not sure that makes young drivers that much it makes them more skilled, but maybe not less Which risky. Allows that, what, right. So, I mean, part of the part of the problem of being young is you don't understand your mortality. Um, you don't understand how much accidents hurt. Um, and there are implications you don't fully understand until you get a little bit older. I'm of the firm belief that Haggerty should be encouraging. Well, I shouldn't say this because I'm going to get myself in trouble for this. I'm... I think everyone should be insurable. I don't think any insurance company should ever say no to somebody. They should just price it appropriately. Mm-hmm. And if somebody's willing to pay whatever whatever it would cost mm. to actuarially have you know offset, offset risk. their risk, then go for it. But there are certainly eighteen year olds who are more trustworthy than you, for example, when you're ninety five now. I mean, my parents gave me a long leash when I was a kid with their cars, and they were less interested in doing that for my brother <laughs> um, but i was a, i was a responsible youth i don't i don't I had very few incidents too, but at we a still young age. moments right i mean yeah i mean uh, well that, and the problem is that they can't customize this per on a per individual basis and so they just say like look here's the statistics and this is the best we can do because we have to treat the numbers as a mass of population because we can't do this on a case-by-case yeah, exactly. basis there's no so but then the, the way that. i see it is in an ideal world that would just be priced in and here it is i'm really sorry but mm-hmm. your na miata is going to cost you thirty eight hundred dollars a year to insure because that's what Jeez. the risk says to do and if you want an agreed value policy and the benefits of this here you are Sorry, you know, maybe we'll give you a, a discount like once you're a 10 year customer and haven't had a claim or something. There's some way to offset it later on. There are all kinds of insurance. Yeah, but the dollars sure. matter now when you're youth, you yeah. know, you can't be like, I'm just going to put this away. Well, listen, my the, that Corolla that I leased in 1990, whatever the fuck it was, 94 when I was 18 years old, the lease was 207.55 and my insurance was 280 a month. <laughs> I had no tickets, no accidents, no records, no nothing. And it's just, just being 18. 18. Yeah. And I canceled the order for the Nissan Sentra SER that I really wanted because that was 360 a month. And I could, no way I could do that. I had to get a full-time job just to pay my insurance. Just to pay yeah. the, the insurance, rather, to go from 20 to 38 hours a week. I mean, yeah. it sucks to be a kid, but, you know. I mean, you were standing on the shoulders or under the heels, I guess, of generations of other youths before you who were negligent. Well, and if I look at some of the things I did and got away with, yes. some of the things I did and didn't get away with, maybe maybe those insurance rates weren't so not justified. Yep. I hate yep. to say. Yep, that's fair. Uh, okay. What is the intake and exhaust system on the 2ZZ Elise that you mentioned that sounded so magnificent? I, I would love to make my engine sound better. I can ask. Uh, it's. I think that car is coming up for sale. Um, it was uh, the orange car that we borrowed for the uh, Lotus Elise Revelations episode. No, not yes. Tesla Roadster episode. Car sounded magic. Uh, I don't know. It was obnoxiously loud, but hmm. wonderful. Uh, DM me or put it some in the comments, and hopefully we'll see it. DM me because Jason doesn't read his DMs. I, I do, but it's a lot. Sorry, I, you make me sound like an asshole. I try so. No, hard. you just have you have a lot of followers. It gets a little send, bit like... Send it to me. Uh, DM me and I will ask Jason. Yeah. Um, okay. Which suspension was in the Amira that we drove? That was a sport, sport. car. Um, do you sport. think an enthusiast will be able to avoid buying an electric car for the next 40 to 50 years? I don't think you should as an enthusiast. You owe it to yourself to try one out. 40 or 50? Yeah. Yeah, I think our cars are not going to be allowed to be driven on the road in 40 or 50 years. I hate to say it. Hmm. So the answer to I that think is, it'll be possible. God, I hope so. But I think it'll be possible. Um, but I do also think that whoever's asking this question should try one out. 
I am 140 trillion years old, and there is definitely a scenario in which I enjoy EV operation. I, yeah, I'm sick. It's like, I like lots of different experiences. I like old luxury cars. I like modern luxury cars. I like old sports cars. I like, there's a lot of different stuff I like. It just added to the quiver of different experiences that you like and enjoy. You know, not every day do you want to drive a... 32 ford with no exhaust system but the days that you do it's cool and then or a gt3 or gt3 touring or whatever else it is yeah no you um you definitely owe it to yourself to to try an ev they are a very different kind of fun it's a very different experience and use it as like an all just just general run around car and there's certain things where you're like oh i feel bad about doing a lot of stopping and going and second gear synchro use and just none of that shit matters and you're just like oh it's weirdly like liberating it's weirdly liberating actually so Sweet. give that a try. Uh, I bought a Lotus Omega on Bring a Trailer, Ooh. and I loved your video. Uh, anyhow, there's dispute in the Omega community community about the cheater code. Can you tell me where that info was from? Uh, I went. I saw this comment come in, and I went through my notes, and it's not in there. And I don't remember where the fuck I found this. So somebody who would know told me. So who did I interview? So it's not in the notes for the document. I didn't go back through my actual like handwritten scribbled notes like when I'm talking to people. But that came from. God, I remember you told me and I was like, oh, that's pretty legit. But I don't remember who it was. Wasn't it someone involved in the uh, from Lotus was involved in powertrain development? I feel like it was the project manager. It was what's his name? Who is the, the guy who was the project manager in an interview that I found with him somewhere? Um, the guy who shit, not, oh, I can't remember his name. Not Julian Thompson. He, he was designed. There was Mike Kimberly. I feel like it was an interview with Kimberly somewhere that I found where he said that. That's and that would explain some of the me. discrepancy between, uh, the, how fast the test cars were and the TÜV cars were. And so a little bit of fuckery going on every time there's a turbo we have time for how many more one or two two, we're we're, we're, we're an hour so we probably okay let's do um how do you derek as a bike rider and jason not as a bike rider view motorcycle enthusiasts in relation to car enthusiasts i see some overlap for sure some people are really strongly in one camp and not the other and there's definitely people who straddle both people who like mechanical stuff uh, and speed and s- speed especially per dollar mm-hmm. motorcycles are incomparable for speed per dollar i mean just if you're a car person and don't understand the motorcycle thing imagine if you could buy a ferrari 812 competizione for used with 2000 miles on it for seventeen thousand dollars. would you do it yeah yeah okay yeah. i mean that's the way the motorcycle sphere i mean operates. that's it's just a no-brainer and that's like an expensive motorcycle right. for ten thousand dollars less you could get something that still does zero to 60 in 2.7 seconds right. So uh, for and seven sixty dollars, yes, yeah. and gets you know fifty miles a gallon. So it's yeah. just value is wild, and the like um, experience. It's very immersive. It's very sensory. It's very like it makes cars feel insular. And so if you are the kind of person who finds a lot of cars to be too insular, then being on a motorcycle really like resolves that problem which is why i should be a motorcycle person yeah even slow motorcycles are like four seconds to 60 yeah Uh, but but you have to have the lack of self-preservation instinct to do it and Mm -hmm. and you have to write that the right mentality i mean people who are quick to quick to anger or people with just good flinch reflex to you know aggressive startle reflexes should never be on a motorcycle and that's yeah and i don't have much of a startle uh response (laughs) Jesus Christ, you didn't even move. <laughs> okay, he's not human. I'm leaving now. <laughs> that was, maybe it's because I don't drink coffee. Oh, maybe that's why. 75 pots a day. No, I'm kidding. Um, okay. okay, well, we made it through like two thirds of the questions no, that shit, people in asked. two episodes? All yeah. Right. Well, we'll get, hang on to the other ones. We can do this again if you guys like them especially. Um, these, I love the questions. They just sow these random things we would never think to talk about. So um, hmm. yeah, I guess in the comments, Derek will read because apparently I'm a, too fucking busy to do this. Um, but yeah, keep throwing comments out. These are fun. I like these a lot. Yeah, I enjoy them as well and it gives people a chance to potentially get their question answered if they pose it at the right place at the right time anyway thanks for joining us we will likely see you next week thanks for watching and uh i don't know drive safely drive an ev drive an old car never stop driving never stop driving
Thank you, St. Haggerty.